One of the things that you're forced to memorize in driver's education courses is that it's better to pump your brakes instead of locking up your brakes if you need to come to a stop relatively quickly. So in this session, we're going to figure out why it is better to pump your brakes than to jam on your brakes or lock them up. So if you imagine that you have some car, and this will be the other car, and you are initially traveling in this direction, and let's call this the positive x direction. So let's write a coordinate system here. So this will be our coordinate system, where you have motion in the positive x direction, and in the upward direction is the positive y direction. So if this is our velocity vector, then the car needs to come to a rest or slow down, and the acceleration will be in the opposite direction of the velocity. So notice that the velocity vector is in the opposite direction of the acceleration vector, and so the object's going to slow down. Now in order to, for this object to slow down, there needs to be a net force in the direction opposite to the direction that this object is traveling. So notice another fundamental concept that the net force is in the same direction as the acceleration. So let's explore how to solve this problem. Now the first thing that we need to do is we need to draw a free body diagram representing the forces acting on this object. So in this case, here's our object which we'll represent with a dot. Now this object has mass, therefore it has weight. The other force acting on this car is going to be the normal force. The ground has to push the car in the upward direction. Now what I want to do is draw something that's technically not part of the free body diagram, but is very important to understanding this problem. And that's the velocity vector. This car is initially moving in this direction. So now we have to figure out the direction in which the net force is acting. And we sort of already did. We said the net force was acting in the opposite direction that the car was moving. And in this case, this is going to be the frictional force or the kinetic frictional force. This is going to be the force responsible for opposing the forward motion of this car. So this is our free body diagram re representing all the forces acting on this object. So what we need to do now is apply Newton's second law. Now Newton's second law says that if you add up all the forces, and in this case I'm going to write it in the vector form because we need to look at the forces acting in two directions, and that's going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. Now the forces are acting on this in two different directions. So we can write this as two separate equations which say that if you add up the forces in the y direction, it's going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the y direction. And if you add up the forces in the x direction, it's going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the x direction. So let's first look at the forces acting on this car in the y direction. So in this case, we have two forces acting in the y direction. Now in the y direction, which I'll write it again like this, is the sum of the forces in the y direction is going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the y direction. Now, this car is sitting on the ground. It's not being accelerated in the upward direction and so the acceleration of this object is going to be zero. It's not moving in the upward direction. The velocity is not changing in that direction. So when you add up all the forces on this object, they're going to equal zero. And in this case, we already said that there's two forces acting on this object. There's the normal force and there's the weight force. And those two forces add up to be zero. Now, to find the magnitude of the normal force, which is what we need in order to determine the frictional force, you need to take the weight force and, and move it to the other side. So to do that, you add the weight to both sides. And when you do that, what you should see is that the normal force equals the weight force in this case. Now there are instances in which the normal force does not equal the weight force, but in this case we're assuming we're driving along a completely horizontal surface or flat surface. So this is the first relationship that we need to know. Now the second relationship that we need to know is the sum of the forces in the x direction. So when you add up the forces in the x direction, it's going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the x direction. Now if you go back to the free body diagram, there's only one force acting in the x direction. And if you go back to our coordinate system, this was the negative x direction. And so this frictional force is acting in the negative x direction. It's in the direction opposite to the direction of motion. And so when you add this using Newton's second law, what you should see is that you get minus F subscript K, the force due to kinetic friction, is going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the x direction. You know this object is accelerating in the x direction because it has to slow down. Otherwise it would continue its state of motion. Now, you know a relationship for the kinetic frictional force, and the kinetic frictional force 
I'll write it off to the side here, you know that the force due to kinetic friction is going to equal the coefficient of kinetic friction times the value of the normal force. And in this case, we already figured out a relationship to the normal force. We said the normal force is equal to the weight of the car, and you should also know that weight equals mass times the gravitational acceleration. So what you can now do is rewrite this as the force due to kinetic friction equals mu k, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna substitute in place of this normal force, which you also see here, the weight force, which in this case equals the mass of the object times the gravitational acceleration. So this is just going to equal mass times the gravitational acceleration. And this is one special case. If you were not on a horizontal surface, the normal force would not equal this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this value right here for the frictional force, in this case the kinetic frictional force, and we're going to plug it in to this term right here. And so when you do that, what you get is negative and I'm going to do this in parentheses so that you see the substitution that I'm making. Mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction, times the mass of the object, times the gravitational acceleration of the object, is going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the x direction. Now, notice a few things. Notice on this side, you have a mass term. On this side, you also have a mass term. So what you can do now is cancel those two terms out. And what you should see is that you get minus mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction, times the gravitational acceleration is going to equal the acceleration in the x direction. Now the really cool thing about this is that the rate at which you slow down does not depend on the mass of the car. It only, only depends on the gravitational acceleration and the kinetic friction between the car's tires and the road. And we have assumed that we haven't modified the car at all, because if we did some modifications, we could change the value of the normal force. All right, so now that we've found the acceleration of the car, that is the rate at which this car is going to slow down, we can figure out how far this car will travel while it's slowing down. So if you remember back from the initial part of the problem, the car's initial velocity was 40 miles per hour. And this is a quick conversion that you should be able to do now to convert miles per hour to meters per second. And what you should see is when you do that, and I'll do it out really quickly, is one mile is 1.61 kilometers, and one kilometer is 1,000 meters. And you know, one hour, has 3,600 seconds. And when you do that all out, what you should get is a initial velocity of about 17.9 meters per second. That's going to be your initial velocity. Notice that this is also a kinematic problem besides just a force problem. Now this car is going to come to a stop, so its final velocity should be zero meters per second. Now one of the things that Newton's second law did was allow us to figure out the acceleration of this object. And in this case, we figured out it was negative mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction, times the gravitational acceleration of this object. Now in this case, we said the coefficient of kinetic friction was 0 0.85. And remember, that's a unitless number. And the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. And when you do this multiplication out, you should get 8 0.33, and notice I forgot a negative sign, so let's make sure we explicitly put that back in, meters per second squared. And this negative sign is telling us that this object is going to be slowing down because the acceleration is in the opposite direction of the velocity, and so this object is going to be slowing down at a rate of 8.33 meters per second every single second. Now the thing that we're looking for is how far this car will travel during during the period of time in which it's slowing down. So that's our question mark. That's what we're looking for. So now you can go to your kinematic equation that says the final velocity squared equals the initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the distance it travels while it's slowing down given this initial velocity and final velocity. Now, you know the, f you know the final velocity is zero because this car comes to a stop and so zero equals the initial squared plus two times the acceleration times the distance it travels. And so what you need to do next is you need to take this term and move it over to the other side. To do that, you need to subtract it from both sides. So minus the initial squared, minus the initial squared from both sides. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other side of an equation. And what you should see is that this works out to be negative v initial squared equals 
2 times the acceleration times the distance this object travels. And so since we're looking for delta x, what you need to do to both sides of the equation now is divide by 2 times the acceleration. And when you do that, you should notice that this term cancels out with that term, and you get delta x, or the distance this object travels, is going to be negative v initial squared divided by 2 times the acceleration. Now the initial velocity, so minus the initial velocity, which was 17.9 meters per second, square the entire term, and now you're going to divide it by 2 times the acceleration, which worked out to be negative 8.33 meters per second squared. And when you do that out, you get 19.2 meters. So this car travels a distance of 19.2 meters while it's slowing down and skidding to a stop. The other thing to notice is that it's a positive 19.2. It's not a negative 19.2. If you go back to our coordinate system in the very beginning, so let's go back to our initial coordinate system, which is right here, we said that we were traveling in the positive x direction. So of course the distance that we traveled during this period of time where the car is coming to a stop is going to be a positive number. All right, in the next video, we'll take a look at what happens when the car pumps its brakes as opposed to lock up its brakes.